Hello and welcome to our presentation, Many Happy Returns, Avoiding Runway Excursions and Runway Overruns. We thank Avemco Insurance Company for their sponsorship, which makes this event possible. We will discuss some aspects of avoiding a runway excursion or runway overrun regarding small general aviation airplanes operating from paved runways. This is not intended to be a comprehensive study of runway excursions or runway overruns. There is much more involved in the subject, but our time is limited. More information can be found on the reference page for this event. I will show a link to the reference page near the end of the presentation, and the link will also be in a follow-up email that will be sent automatically. I don't need to tell you where the exits are like in a regular seminar. Our emergency would be a system crash. In the unlikely event that that happens, please check your email. Your attendance at this event may qualify you to earn one credit for Basic Knowledge 3 plus one credit for Advanced Knowledge 2 FAA Wings Credit. To be eligible, you must be logged in for most of the session and must participate in most of the polls. How you respond to the polls does not matter. Your response just proves that you are participating and not just logged in. Sorting the data and issuing the credit is a little bit time consuming, so please allow up to seven days for your credit to be issued. In case you didn't know, Avemco is a sponsor of the FAST team and pays for the wings that we receive when we complete a phase of wings. This webinar qualifies for the Avemco Safety Rewards Program. At the end of this presentation, I will tell you how you might be eligible for a discount on your aircraft insurance for attending this webinar. So stay tuned. My name is Gene Benson and I will be your host and presenter for this webinar. I have been flying and teaching about flying for a very long time, but that does not mean I have all the answers. I certainly do not. However, I do have many years experience in studying aircraft accidents and incidents and finding ways to help prevent them. I encourage everyone to sign up to receive my free and also advertising free monthly newsletter called Vectors for Safety and to visit VectorsForSafety.com for much more safety information. I have two folks on the controls with me today. First is my friend and colleague Lane Lisser. Lane is an accomplished aerobatic pilot and we see him here with his Kristen Eagle. Next is Roderez Vernica. Roderez describes himself as a certified pilot and an avid aviation learner. He has a PhD in computer science and is currently working in the high-tech industry. He is also a volunteer with the Sheriff's Surf and, uh, Search and Rescue Team. Both Lane and Roderez reside in California. So let's begin. We know that we are required by regulation to do some pre-flight planning. Well, there's a reason for that. The error chain frequently begins hours or even days before the accident. Sometimes the first link is insufficient pre-flight planning. In addition to a thorough analysis of expected weather, we need to learn everything we can learn about the airports that we plan to use and also about our alternate airport, airports. It is really all about preparation. Oh, well, no, not that kind of preparation. We mean preparation for the flight. Be in the know. What we do not know can hurt us. In April of 2015, a pilot was mistaken as to the correct frequency for the pilot activated lighting. He ended up aligned with the hangar lights rather than the runway lights. A check of the chart supplement provides us with the information we need to know. Our destination airport becomes the destination for each leg of the flight. Make sure to have an ample fuel reserve to reach the alternate if necessary. Study each planned stop and each alternate as if it is the final destination. I have read several accident reports in which the accident pilot missed a piece of information that was important. There really is no excuse um, to not know all there is about our airports that we intend to use or that we might use. Study each airport as depicted in the current chart supplement. Note that the example shown depicts a military helicopter landing area. Large helicopters produce powerful wake turbulence. Of course, we must also check NOTAMs for current conditions. 
we what we don't know about an airport really can hurt us. There's a link to the digital tar chart supplements on the webinar reference page. We must make ourselves aware of all pertinent information for each airport. There's no shame in writing it down, either digitally or old school with a, a pad and a pen. Many accidents happen because the pilot did not know some particular fact about the airport. As we saw a few slides previously, the pilot did not know the frequency for the pilot controlled lighting. He ended up lining up with the lights from the hangar and actually hitting the hangar. Uh, consider calling ahead and talking to a live person on the field just to be sure if you have any questions. What about the wind? Sometimes we focus on ceiling and visibility, but we ignore the forecast wind. Botched crosswind landings are a common cause of runway excursions. More about crosswind landings later. Being prepared for the flight helps to improve our situational awareness, so we'll spend just a little bit of time on the concept. One definition of situational awareness is this. Situational awareness, or SA, refers to the degree of accuracy by which one's perception of the current environment mirrors reality. Always good to be aware of our surroundings. These are some critical situa uh, situational awareness items. Any of these items can be the gotcha that makes an approach and landing not end well. To help increase situational awareness during the critical approach and landing phase, we can review the information that we gathered during the pre-flight planning. We must use an approach briefing checklist. After the first three items beginning with the airport elevation, all these items can be researched before takeoff. Yes, we might not know which runway will be in use, but we should be prepared for any runway at our destination or alternate airports. With the information already researched, we can run this checklist before entering the traffic pattern. Once we do that, our situational awareness meter shows a dramatic increase. Our situational awareness is affected by our physical and mental state. Applying the I'm safe checklist can alert us to items that may be impacting our fitness to fly, including our ability to maintain situational awareness. Of course, any decrease in situational awareness will manifest itself in a decreased pilot capability. An in-depth discussion of situational awareness is not within our scope today, but it is definitely important. More information on the webinar reference page. One of the most important concepts for any landing is to establish and maintain a stabilized approach. If the approach path is not constant, the approach is not stabilized. There are also some other elements to the stabilized approach. First, we must establish an altitude below which an immediate go around or missed approach will be executed if the approach is not stabilized or becomes unstabilized. 500 feet AGL works well for most GA operations. Be sure to convert that to MSL before beginning the approach, of course. Here are some generally recognized criteria for an approach to be considered stabilized. Uh, we'll discuss them individually. First, the aircraft is on the correct flight path, not way too high, not way too low, and not maneuvering to get lined up. Only small changes in heading or pitch are required to maintain the correct flight path. Not only on the right path, but not struggling to stay there. The aircraft speed is not more than the desired approach speed that we call VREF plus 10 knots. So not more than more than 10 knots beyond uh, VREF. And of course we're using indi indicated airspeed there. And also not less than VREF. So we want a range of VREF plus 10 minus 0. And VREF is simply the speed that you want to be at for this stage of the approach. The aircraft is in the uh, correct landing configuration. That includes the gear, flap, prop control, mixtures, anything else required. Number five, the rate of descent is no greater than 500 feet per minute. If a descent rate uh, greater than 500 feet per minute is required due to approach considerations, then we must vow to pay uh, special attention to that. The power setting is appropriate for the aircraft configuration. What do we mean by that? Well, let's say we have a complex single engine airplane and it usually requires about 20 inches of manifold pressure to maintain final approach speed. But today we only need 17 inches. Hmm, 
any internal alarm set off? Well, maybe either the flaps or the gear are not properly configured. Number seven, all briefings and checklists have been accomplished. Eight, if the approach becomes unstabilized below the stabilization, uh, stabilization altitude, an immediate go around or missed approach must be initiated. And the key word here is immediate. Don't wait and fight it. Get out of there. Come back to fight another day. All right, so let's look at some accident examples. We, we don't do this to criticize any pilot. We're all human. We're all capable of making errors. We do this so that we might learn some lessons on how to be safer pilots. You see here my standard disclaimer. You can all read, so I won't read it to you. This accident happened in Kansas in 2017 and involved a Cessna 210. According to the NTSB accident report, quote, the private pilot reported that he landed around 80 knots and didn't get the flaps down before landing. He further reported that the airplane didn't want to stop and that it then ran off the end of the runway. During the runway excursion, the nose wheel collapsed and the airplane nosed over, end quote. The airplane was likely landing with a tailwind of about seven knots. The NTSB report states, a witness reported that he was at the airport in a hangar and noticed that the airplane was high, fast, and downwind. He stated that he observed the airplane overrun the runway and nose over into the grass. NTSB probable cause, quote, the pilot's decision to continue an unstabilized approach for landing in tailwind conditions, which resulted in a runway overrun and a nose over, end quote. Our lesson is to discontinue an approach that is not stabilized. We really need to internalize that rule and make it a part of our being. There's a strong human tendency to continue what we have begun, in this case, an approach. So this is our segue into the next section. Our humanness often leads us down paths that we should not travel. Some of those paths end up in runway excursions or worse. Let's take just a little bit of time to explore that. First, we have the conscious mind versus the unconscious mind. It simply means that there are unconscious inner forces outside of our awareness that are directing our behavior. The unconscious processes have a great impact on our decision making. Our motivation on the unconscious level can play a huge role. Sometimes that unconscious motivation is egocentric, such as wanting to show off piloting skill, and sometimes it comes from a true desire to solve a problem, such as getting somebody where they need to go but the strong processes operating on the unconscious level can provide a strong basis for the formulation of our decisions on the conscious level. We are strongly affected by what we call external factors. We understand the compelling need to meet our commitments such as being somewhere on time or to provide a promised flight. We know that the various external factors can be powerful motivators. We also know that the vast majority of pilots are not daredevils or excessive risk takers, yet most serious accidents involve a bad decision by a pilot, and that's often a very experienced pilot. One explanation is that we are making many of our decisions in the unconscious mind, and those decisions are frequently based on our unconscious motivations. Our unconscious mind bends the facts to fit the motivations and fools us into thinking that we are making a logical decision. The unconscious mind is heavily influenced by our cognitive biases. Psychologists disagree about how many cognitive biases there are, but only a few of these biases have a significant impact on error reduction. One definition is a pattern of deviation in judgment, whereby inferences about other people and situations may be drawn in an illogical fashion. This mismatch between our judgment and reality is the result of a bias. Let's look at one of those cognitive biases. Illusory superiority is a cognitive bias whereby individuals estimate their own qualities and abilities relative to others. This is evident in a variety of areas including intelligence, performance on tasks or tests, and the possession of desirable characteristics or personality traits. In other words, our humanness causes us to believe that we are just a little bit better than the next person. Now that isn't being arrogant, that's normal and it's being human. Here's another one, optimism bias, also known as unrealistic or comparative optimism, is a cognitive bias that causes a person to believe that he or she is less at risk of experiencing a negative event compared to others. 
As humans, we also possess another cognitive bias called confirmation blindness. That is our tendency to stick with a decision, when it, even when it's a bad one. Our brain will filter out information that contradicts our decision and allows only information that supports our decision to get through. So if we are overconfident in our abilities and make a bad decision, let's say to depart into weather that's beyond the capabilities of ourselves or our airplane, we will be very reluctant to deviate or to turn back. We see only glimmers of hope, such as momentary view of the ground or a decrease in precipitation or decrease in ice or whatever the problem might be. I cannot emphasize um, enough how important the human factors are in this, our decision making. But we need to move on. A significant number of runway excursions happened during the execution of a crosswind landing. So let's talk about that subject. Before we begin the discussion of crosswind landings, let's return to our pre-flight presentation. We should have a pretty good idea of what to expect at any time um, at any of our possible landing runways regarding the crosswind component. The wind will probably not be exactly what was forecast, but we should be able to identify dangerous or marginal conditions before we depart on the flight. We're all familiar with this crosswind component chart. For a rule of thumb, without the chart, we can still come pretty close. If the wind differs from the runway heading by 15 degrees, crosswind component is about one quarter of the wind velocity. Difference between the wind and the runway is 30 degrees, crosswind is half of the reported wind speed. If the wind makes a 45 degree angle with the runway, the crosswind component is three quarters or 75% of the overall wind speed. And when the wind sock is pointing 60 degrees or more from the runway center line, just assume the crosswind is the same as the total wind. It's pretty close and you'd only be overestimating the crosswind component, which is probably a good thing. The greater the angle, also, the more dangerous the gusts. What about the maximum demonstrated crosswind component? There are always a lot of questions about that and what does it mean and do we have to come abide by it and so on. Well, to be certified, an airplane must be satisfactorily controllable with no exceptional degree of skill or alertness on the part of the pilot in 90 degree crosswinds up to a velocity equal to 0.2 VS0 or our stall speed clean. Now often the demonstrated crosswind component is greater than the minimum required for certification. In fact, that's the case in most airplanes. Landing with less than the demonstrated crosswind component is not a regulatory requirement under Part 91. But if you exceed the demonstrated crosswind component and you have an accident, that will be pointed out very clearly in the accident report. However, the maximum for the airplane might not be the maximum for the pilot. We have to be honest with ourselves about our proficiency in handling a crosswind. How long has it been since we tackled a stiff or gusty crosswind? Let's review the mechanics of a crosswind landing. The runway center line can be tracked by establishing a wind correction angle or a crab angle. That's exactly what we do on a cross-country flight to maintain the desired ground tack. Some pilots advocate maintaining the crab until just before touchdown and then kicking it out. Well, the problem with that approach is that uh, the timing has to be precise, and if the conditions are at all gusty, we have to have some luck going for us as well. If we contact the runway in a crab angle, that can put significant side load on the landing gear. We'll come to that in just, um, just a minute. Now, the side slip can also be used to track the runway center line. Beware, though, that the side slip will increase drag and the rate of descent. And some airplanes also have a limitation as to how long a side slip may be held. This is usually associated with the design of the fuel system. But the side slip approach is the generally preferred crosswind landing method. We simply keep the longitudinal axis of the airplane aligned with the runway center line by using the rudder and adjust for drift with the ailerons. The airplane touches down on one main wheel, and then we place the other main wheel down. The best crosswind landings result from utilizing the crabbed approach until the airplane is on short final and then transitioning to the side slip. It is very, very important that the longitudinal axis of the airplane be aligned with the runway at touchdown. With a side load, the center of gravity wants to continue moving in the same direction as the drift. This will cause the airplane to tip and to swerve and that can set up the perfect storm for a runway excursion. The side, load, uh, the side load can also lead to a ground loop. So now we're on the ground. 
but we're not done yet. Once we're on the ground, we must maintain airplane control. We want to avoid the rollover in tricycle gear airplanes or the ground loop in any airplane, but more commonly in tail draggers. Now the cornering angle has much to do with this. Cornering angle is the angular difference between the heading of a tire and its path. Whenever a load-bearing tire's path and uh, heading diverge, a side load is created. It is accompanied by tire distortion. As little as 10 degrees of quartering angle creates a side load equal to half the supported weight. Now for each high wing tricycle gear airplane there is a cornering angle at which rollover becomes inevitable. Tail draggers are more susceptible to ground loop but it can happen in any airplane. The example, uh, the example shown here is not a runway excursion because the airplane did not leave the runway. But ground loops often end up beside the runway. In any case, we want to avoid landing with a side load on the landing gear. Let's look at another accident example. Again, we do this to learn from the misfortune of others. We saw the full disclaimer a few minutes ago. This accident involved a Cirrus SR-22. The private pilot and sole occupant was not injured when the airplane departed the runway in New Jersey in June of 2019. According to the NTSB accident report, quote, the pilot reported that during landing with a crosswind before touchdown, a wind gust pushed the airplane left. The airplane touched down. The pilot attempted to correct, but the airplane exited the runway to the left. The left wing struck the ground and the empennage separated. End quote. The accident report also states, quote, an automated weather observation station located 15 miles southwest of the accident site reported that about 16 minutes before the accident, the wind was from 090 degrees at 18 knots, gusting to 22 knots. The pilot reported that the wind was variable from 080 degrees to 110 degrees and gusting between 12 and 18 knots. The pilot landed the airplane on runway 06, end quote. The NTSB probable cause states, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain directional control during landing with gusting crosswind conditions, which resulted in a runway excursion and subsequent substantial damage, end quote. The pilot stated in the pilot operator report submitted to the NTSB that his recommendation to have prevented the accident was to, quote, be more aggressive in his crosswind correction, abort the landing, and or divert to an alternate runway." Unquote. Remember what we discussed earlier about continuation blindness? Our humanness causes us to continue a task when we sometimes should try something else. Look at another accident example. You know the disclaimer by now. Coincidentally, this accident also involved a Cirrus SR-22. It happened in Tennessee in December of 2019. Neither the private pilot nor the passenger was injured. The NTSB accident report contains the following explanation, quote, The pilot reported that while landing, the airplane encountered a crosswind gust and drifted left. At touchdown, a second gust lifted the right wing. The airplane drifted off the runway center line and the left wing impacted grass. The pilot added power. However, the left wing continued to drag in the grass, the airplane exited the runway, and the landing gear collapsed. Both wings sustain substantial damage. End quote. The landing on runway uh, that was the landing was on runway one nine, which is six thousand five hundred three feet long and one hundred feet wide. The report states that the wind direction was from two six zero degrees at twenty knots, gusting to twenty eight knots. That indicates a crosswind of approximately seventy degrees, which, according to our rule of thumb, should be considered a direct crosswind. The NTSB provided the landing section of the Pilot Operating Handbook, or POH, for the airplane. Though it is stated that the airplane has been successfully landed in a direct crosswind of 20 knots, they caution pilots as follows. The maximum allowable crosswind velocity is dependent upon pilot capability as well as aircraft limitations. Not surprisingly, the NTSB probable cause finding states, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain directional control during landing with a gusty crosswind, which resulted in a runway excursion and the left wing impacting grass, end quote. 
The pilot stated that the wind was from 270 degrees at 14 to 24 knots. This is less than the official report, but still mostly a direct crosswind with gusts that exceeded the demonstrated uh, crosswind capability of the airplane. Why did the pilot attempt this uh, landing in such conditions? Well, we don't know, but remember our cognitive bias that, um, that we call illusory superiority. We all think that we are a bit better than the average pilot and we can handle any situation. In the pilot's recommendations as to how the accident might have been avoided, he stated what I believe to mean that he should never have flown on that morning. He also stated that an airport 10 miles to the north had a 927 runway, which would have mostly avoided the crosswind. So we might have illusory superiority and we might have continuation bias and um, we might also have some optimism bias going on for us there. We don't know for sure. All right, hydroplaning is sometimes listed as a causal factor of runway excursion, but um, you know, let's review that just a little bit. Hydroplaning is a condition that can exist when an airplane has landed on a runway surface contaminated with standing water, slush, and or wet snow. Hydroplaning can have serious adverse effects on ground controllability and braking efficiency. There are three distinct types of hydroplaning, but a it's beyond our scope to get into that here. We can, though, state two simple measures that can help us avoid hydroplaning. First, make sure there's some tread on the tires, and second, use good braking technique. That is, apply max pressure just short of skidding the tires. Or, of course, just avoid contaminated runways, and we, we know that that might not always be practical. The airplane lands on the runway, but now must dissipate its kinetic energy. We will use aerodynamic braking as much as possible, but we might need more than that. The rest of the energy dissipation task relies on our brakes slowing down the rotation of our wheels and tires, and then on our tires gripping the runway surface. An important element in our quest to avoid the runway excursion is the condition of our tires and brakes. That could be an entire seminar by itself. We'll only scratch the surface here, but there are links to some great material on the webinar reference page on that. Let's begin with our tires. They deserve more than a quick glance during the pre-flight inspection. We want to carefully check three things, damage, wear, and proper inflation. This photo shows the main gear tires on a Learjet that was involved in a runway overrun. Note that at least one and possibly two of the tread grooves are substantially worn away. An excerpt from the Goodyear Maintenance Manual post, uh, provided by the NTSB as part of the accident report for this Learjet uh, accident uh, states the following, quote, inspect, tread, uh, inspect treads visually and check remaining tread. Tires should be removed when tread has worn to the base of any groove at any spot or up to one-eighth of the tire circumference. Checking the tires becomes much more difficult when we have wheel fairings installed. Personally, I'm not a fan of wheel fairings. They look nice, but they sometimes make checking the tires nearly impossible. Also, they can become clogged with snow or mud and cause some real problems. Most wheel fairings are strictly cosmetic. They add weight, and do not make any real difference in drag reduction. There have been a few airplanes in which wheel fairings actually increase drag and, and in addition to adding weight. I'm not suggesting that you go out tomorrow and uh, remove your wheel pants. Uh, they might serve an important function on some airplanes, just something to think about, that's all. Do we really roll that airplane enough to check the tires all the way around on every pre-flight? Hmm, just saying. The brakes are critical to staying on the runway. During the pre-flight inspection, we should check the general condition of the brake. Make sure there is adequate brake lining remaining and look for any liquid that might indicate a hydraulic leak. If there's a puddle near a wheel, check to see if it's water or if it's oily. If it's oily, it might be time to let the maintenance folks take a look. In my younger days, I used to dip my finger in the puddle and taste the liquid. I don't think anybody would recommend that anymore. When we first begin to taxi, we should tap the brakes to make sure they work there's a problem we want to know right away. We don't want to know that when we're approaching the end of the taxiway and there's another airplane stop there. We also want to check for smooth and even operation of both the left and the right brakes. There have been runway excursions after landing when one brake worked and the other did not. 
or one brake worked and the other locked up. Let's look at another accident example. Now you know the disclaimer. This accident involved an Aranco 7AC and happened in Georgia in 2019. The private pilot and sole occupant was not injured, but as you can see, the airplane was uh, really substantially damaged here. According to the NTSB accident report, quote, the pilot reported that he approached the turf runway intending to conduct a full stop landing. He stated that upon applying the brakes, the right brake stuck and would not release, which resulted in the airplane veering right. The pilot attempted to pump the brakes to release the right brake and was unable to regain directional control. The airplane traveled off the right side of the runway and impacted trees. A ground scar consisted with skidding of the right tire was observed on the turf runway leading up to the edge of the road near where the airplane came to rest." End quote. Also according to the NTSB accident report, quote, during a post-accident interview, the airplane's owner stated that the brakes were very old and required frequent adjustments and that she had planned to replace them. Review of the airplane, uh, airframe logbooks revealed multiple entries relating to the right brake in the four years before the accident." End quote. NTSB also re, uh, report also states, quote, post-accident examination of the operational testing of the brake assemblies did not reveal any evidence of pre-impact mechanical malfunctions or failures that would have caused the right brake to lock, end quote. However, we don't know for sure, but given the history of the brake write-ups uh, in the airframe logbook and the skid mark evidence on the runway, it just kind of seems logical that there really was a problem with that brake. Lesson to be learned. Neglected maintenance will come around to bite us eventually. It's possible that all of this damage could have been avoided by replacing the brakes. Again, we don't know that for sure, but uh, anytime we have something that seems to be a problem continually, we, we really need to just get it fixed. I guarantee that, that that repair will not cost as much as what an accident would cost in the end. And of course, we also have the risk of injury or death should things go wrong. All right, so in summary, we looked at some of the elements that can lead to a runway excursion or runway overrun. We, rein, uh, we reinforced the importance of flight planning to make sure we have good options when we arrive at our destination or if we need to divert. We reviewed the importance of setting criteria for a stabilized approach and resolving to abandon an approach that becomes unstabilized. We revisited the human element and how our humanness can sometimes lead us into making bad decisions. Since many runway excursions and runway overruns occur during crosswind landing attempts, we reviewed some of the basics. We briefly discussed hydroplaning and the importance of having good tires and brakes. A presentation such as this can barely scratch the surface of a complex, multi-element problem such as runway excursions and runway overruns. I encourage everyone to look deeper into the subject. The reference page for this webinar has links to some other valuable resources. Here's how to access uh, the webinar reference page. Just visit vectorsforsafety.com and click the download slash links tab at the top of the page. That will take you to this page where you can access information on some of the things we discussed. Shown here is only a partial view of the page. There's much more listed. That page also includes a link to watch the recorded webinar. Please feel free to share it with others. In case you did not know, Evemco offers a safety rewards program. Attendees at this event or any of my other events or those who take any safety-based education courses can receive a percentage off their annual Avemco premium at the time of quote or renewal. All you have to do is let Avemco know. Please visit our, visit our website, vectorsforsafety.com. There are links to videos and to online courses. Most of the webinars in the series have been recorded and can be found in the videos section on that site. You can also join my mailing list to receive my free newsletter, Vectors for Safety. And please remember, Always fly like your life depends on it.